Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Single Skin Metal Siding uh, webinar, Performance and Design Considerations. It's presented today by AEP SPAN. Uh, it's part of our series of webinars at Metal Architecture Magazine. I'm Paul Deffenbaugh, the Editorial Director at Metal Architecture, and we're glad you've joined us. In just a little bit, I'm going to turn things over to Jeff Haddock, who is today's speaker. Uh, before we start, I want to preview how we're going to work today. The webinar will last about an hour. There are four sections, and at the end of each section, Jeff is going to answer questions. You can send us your questions through the screen interface. I'll monitor, then raise the questions with Jeff. A lot of you uh, will want to know how the CEUs and certificates will be handled. If you entered your AIA number during registration, you don't need to do anything else. It will be submitted automatically. Tomorrow, everyone's going to receive an email that will have this following information on it. It's going to have how to get a certificate, how to download a copy of the presentation, and where to view the webinar again if you want to, as well as uh, quite a bit of other contact information. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Jeff. Haddock, who is the Technical Services Manager for AEP SPAN, which is a division of NS Blue Scope Coated Products in North America. Jeff's a 17-year veteran in the metal roofing industry, serving in various manufacturing roles, including production, production scheduler, production supervisor, and inside sales. In Jeff's current role, which he's had for the last 11 years, he trains staff as well as installers on the proper use of installation of AEP SPAN roof and wall products. He also provides technical guidance for metal roof and wall installations and handles applications inquiries from the design community. When Jeff isn't drafting internal and external technical documents or managing AEP SPAN's roofing weather tight warranty program, he's contributing to the industry in other ways. And one we like to point out is that he has collaborated with our sister publication, Metal Construction News, and a number of articles over the last few years. So we're very familiar with Jeff and we're glad he's joined us today. Jeff? Take it away. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. I'd like to thank uh, Metal Architecture for giving a, us the opportunity to uh, participate in this uh, webinar. And I'd like to thank everybody that has joined us this morning. And uh, hopefully we get you guys some good information out there on uh, this course, uh, which is going to be on single skid metal siding performance and installation considerations. So as most of you know, this is an AIA continuing education course, and uh, it is eligible for one health, safety, and welfare learning unit at the completion of this course. So just not going to go too much into this slide here. Um, so basically, what we've got here is the course description, which I'm uh, going to go verbatim on this one here with single skin metal wall siding is a great example of continued advancement of building products in the architectural market that is driven by more sophisticated design and greater emphasis on sustainable building practices. This course explores the different types of single skin metal siding specification details as well as performance and design considerations. So topics that we're going to be going over, material inputs, performance attributes, environmental impacts, and sustainability. And uh, these topics are key aspects of today's modern single skin siding applications. So there are, as Paul mentioned, there are going to be four units or actually four objectives within this course. And we'll take questions after each section if there are any. Uh, first section is going to be understanding material inputs and performance attributes for single skin metal siding. Section two is going to be covering the environmental impact and sustainability of single skin metal siding. Third section is going to be talking about the different types of single skin siding and some specification considerations that you should take into consideration. And then the fourth section is going to be design and installation that uh, facilitates successful single skin solutions. So into learning objective one, which is going to be focused on material inputs and performance attributes. So single skid metal siding is made up of several material inputs and each material performs a specific function. We're gonna start with the base of the panel and work our way through the layers of the coating used on single skid metal panels. The base of the metal panel is made up of either steel or aluminum, and both offer long-lasting performance. 
Steel panels are offered in a range of gauges or thicknesses, starting from 18 gauge up to the, being the heaviest, down to 29 gauge being the lightest. They also are available in aluminum, which is comes in industry standard thicknesses of 050, 040, and 032. And at the end of their useful life, uh, all metal sidings are 100% recyclable. Coatings do not interfere with the panels being recyclable, meaning if there's any paint applied to that, it does not interfere with the recyclability of the material itself. The next layer of the single skin metal siding panel is the metallic coating, which provides corrosion protection. For steel panels, there are two types of metallic coatings. There's an aluminum zinc coating and a galvanized coating. The aluminum zinc coating is made up of 55% aluminum and 45% zinc. This is known in the market as galvalum or zinc alum, which we'll be referring to those uh, as such moving forward. The aluminum component being 55% offers the barrier protection and is inert, meaning it does not react and does not corrode. The zinc component, being 45% of the coating, provides sacrificial characteristics that protect the material's cut edge. Typically applied to metal siding panels in 22, 24, 26, and 29 gauge. Galvanized coating is 100% zinc and comes in different coating thicknesses, with most common being G90 and G60. G90 being thicker coating, typically there is no corrosion warranty offered on galvanized substrates. And galvanized substrates can range in gauge thicknesses from 18 gauge being the heaviest down to the thinner gauges of 29. Um, zinc alum and galvalum coatings offer a higher corrosion performance over galvanized, uh, being as there's no warranty on galvanized and zinc alum being a, a superior product. And then when dealing with aluminum panels, uh, aluminum panels do not require a metallic coating because aluminum material naturally develops a durable oxide film on the surface when exposed to moisture, moisture and is nearly impervious to further corrosion. So after the metallic coating, there is a pretreatment coating which allows the paint to adhere to the metal aluminum substrate. And that's what we've got here. The primer coat allows for uh, further adhesion of the cool top coat or paint finish. The cool top coat is the last layer, which is the paint color that is not only contributes to design, but also has important energy efficient attributes, which will we will cover in a few slides. The bottom layer is the backer coat, which is an inexpensive polyester paint system. And that's what we've got here on the back side. And basically, the use of that paint system is to protect the panels during installation and when they're stacked together for shipment to help prevent road abrasion. So single skin metal siding panels are also available in galvalum or zinc alum coating with a clear top resin coat. So basically no paint offered on these whatsoever. So this would just be and that's an example of what you see here in this photo is the bare zinc alum or galvalum uh, coated steel panel. Clear coat offers a sheen that enhances the natural characteristics of metal, offers a bare steel aesthetic design, resists scuff marks and fingerprints, allowing you to maintain a consistent satin smooth finish throughout delivery and installation, offers energy efficient attributes and can also be painted over without primers. So you can actually, if you're not happy with the color selection of a particular manufacturer, panels available in bare can be field painted to match desired colors. And we're going to get into the types of paint systems. So there's three major paint types or polymer technologies used for steel coatings. Uh, this is a simple visual of the order of the three paint systems from top down to bottom of a performance perspective. So the first one we've got is the polyester. Then we get into the silicon uh, modified polyester or SMP as it's referred to in the industry. And then we get into the Cadillac coating or the high-end coating, which is the fluorocarbon, often known as Kynar, Hylar, or PVDF, which is the best coating offered out there for in the metal industry. So 
going into each of the different paint systems. The polyester paint system is the least expensive paint system used for gutters and downspouts, residential trim, and as a backer coat for metal siding and metal coil. By using a polyester paint system on the back of the metal and the metal coil prevents transit abrasion to the top finish coat during shipping and to the backside during installation. An SMP paint system offers better resistance to color chalk and fade compared to a polyester paint system and is a versatile paint system. Used primarily for commercial projects, it comes in a wide range of cool colors with energy efficient attributes. An SMP paint system offers better chalk and fade resistance as compared to a polyester paint system. It's more of a mid-range paint system, so it is less expensive than a, a Kynar or a Hylar paint system, which is also known as a PVDF coating. Uh, typically provides a film integrity chalk and fade warranty, has longer film integrity chalk and fade warranty than a polyester paint system, so it is better than the polyester being this is a mid-grade. And it's typically used on lighter gauge metal siding panels for commercial and residential applications. So now we're going into the high end coating, which is the PVDF. So the PVDF paint system is a premium system that provides outstanding resistance to ultraviolet radiation with exceptional color retention, resistance, and chalk and chemical degradation. Used on high-end architectural projects in aggressive environments, this paint is awesome, also referred to as a Kynar 500 or Hylar 5000. comes in a wide range of cool colors with energy-efficient attributes, bright, rich colors with a clear top coat to ensure long-life performance. Typically, the longest film integrity chalk and fade warranty in the industry. Uh, warranties for this type of paint system are getting in the upwards of ranging from 30 to 40 years. Uh, for chalk and fade resistance. Um, they're typically used on educational, public, government, healthcare, and commercial projects. Uh, so PVDF system is also available in a marine coating for severe corrosive and saltwater environments. So there's two types of PVDF marine paint system warranties, which we have a 15 year limited warranty with a high build primer applied under the top coat that is required. And there's also a 20 year limited warranty for a high build primer applied under the top coat, but then they also require a clear coat applied over the finish color. A PVDF marine paint system comes in a wide range of cool colors with energy efficient attributes and applied to aluminum zinc coated steel substrates or aluminum as well. Uh, general limitations when you're dealing with a marine paint system requirement is that any project that's going to be installed within a thousand feet or excuse me, thousand to 1500 feet of the surf break is where you would need to look at start using a high build marine paint system. Anything outside of that exclusion zone, typically our standard paint systems are more than adequate and eligible for full warranty. So you may have noticed that uh, we've, I've been using the term cool colors and you may have heard the term cool roofs. The same paint system used on metal roofs are used on metal siding panels. So let's look at the first bullet point here. So solar radiation reaches the Earth's surface in three distinct wavelengths. It's the IR radiation that generates the heat on the surface of the panel. The pigment and the paint systems have been altered with special IR reflective pigments that stay cooler than traditional pigments. So when the IR radiation wavelength hits the surface of the siding, the paint system allows for solar reflectance and thermal admittance and contributes to keeping the building cool, conserving energy and saving on energy costs. This is a visual that some of you may have seen for the uh, reflective roofs. So it's the same paint systems apply for wall systems. And this is a great visual showing of how the sun's radiation hits the wall, heats it up, and, and uh, reflectivity and emissivity reflect some of that absorbed energy out, allowing minimal amounts to absorb into the building. So this is a good point because this is an often confused and misunderstood aspect with regards to solar reflective values, emissivity, reflectivity. The question of light reflectance values does come up occasionally. So 
So here's a quick overview. So light reflectance is the visible light reflected by the surface. The LRV is measured for the amount of visible or usable light that reflects from the surface. The higher the number, the more visible light is reflected. A visual example is when glare is reflected from the surface. Typically, light colors have a much higher value than darker colors, but texture can impact the LRV as well. Manu quality manufacturers should be able to provide the LRV for a specific color. Uh, note that while there is some overlap between LRV and SRV, as many coated surfaces may have a similar LRV and SRV value, they are not the same measurement. Solar reflective values. Uh, or SRV measures the amount of total solar radiation in farad and ultraviolet that is reflected from the surface. The SRV measurement is expressed as a percentage from 1 to 100. The higher the number, the more solar radiation that is reflected. The higher SRV value, the cooler the surface stays in direct sunlight. And this is a very important aspect here. But I know this is something that's coming up more a lot in residential applications, uh, downtown applications where you may have homeowners associations and things of that where a roof may or a wall may get installed and they have actually set limits to reflective values so that the, the sun coming up in the morning is not bouncing off of the material and glaring into the neighbor's window. So that's what the LRV is more so talking about there. That's the end of our first section. Um, do we have any questions? Thanks. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, thanks very much. Good. We got. We do have a question about uh, baked enamel. Enamel. Excuse me. Baked enamel finishes from Chuck, who asked, mm -hmm. "What is baked enamel finish, and what's a?" And he uses the brand term, the ceramic star finish, uh, ceramic pigments. Do you? Can you go into that at all, or are we going off topic? Off topic. Basically, what we're dealing with in the metal industry, we're dealing, you know, the three paint systems that we typically deal with, and they are baked on resin coating systems that are cooked at about 1,500 degrees to the to the coil coater. Um, not too much information I hear for baked on enamel ceramic coatings, as far as what industry practices are from it within this presentation. And another quick question here: um, the uh, all the paint systems listed in the presentation are typical for metal, metal applications. Are all of them considered to have cool ratings? Yes, the uh, three systems described in this presentation are the three most commonly used paint systems for metal. And then all three of them are formulated with cool pigments and should have published reflectivity and emissivity values from reputable manufacturers. Uh, what differentiates one paint system from the other is weatherability. Chalk and fade resistance from a high-end coating such as Kynar is reduced when you go with a low-end coating such as a polyester. Great, great. Let's uh, let's keep forging ahead. Thank you. Absolutely. So the next in uh, section that we're going to be dealing with is environmental impact and sustainability. We'll move right along into the first slide here. So we begin by this. Uh, we, we, we begin this learning objective by highlighting research on cool siding conducted by the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, referred to as LBNL, which is the nation's scientific research lab for the U.S. Department of Energy. They explore cool siding benefits, technology, and infrastructure in a research project sponsored by the California Energy Commission Electric Program Investments Charge. Here's a high-level overview of what that research is. They evaluated annual energy costs and emission savings in all California climates and U.S. climate zones one through four from 2015 to 2018. They use a program to model energy consumption for a variety of project types, such as multifamily, various office buildings, and hotels. The findings from the research indicate that cool siding saves energy, money, and carbon dioxide in warm climates, mitigates urban heat island, tends to stay clean, and cool coatings on metal siding products are available today, often at no extra charge. And that, re and that no extra charge point I'm trying to make is that, and that refers back to the question that you asked, Paul, about all paint systems having cool pigments. You're going to get the cool pigment regardless of the paint system you're selecting. It's just the weatherability and the long-term lasting effects of the paint system are reduced based off of the type of paint system you choose, but all paint systems are formulated uh, with cool pigments. Um, and they, they don't. We, the industry does not charge extra for a cool coating on those. So just to kind of elaborate on what that meant. 
So the uh, LBNL seeks to expand and enhance the cool siding provisions found in the U.S. Code Standards and Green Building Programs. Stay cool siding are currently found in U.S. Code Standards and Green Building Programs. LBNL is, is developing new cool siding measures and code standards in green building programs. They are working on establishing a cool siding product rating system and modeling on or expanding the existing program. And then some good news we found out here in the last few months is that the Cool Roof Rating Council is also proposing to create a rating program for exterior siding products similar to the roofing program, which we are continuing to monitor. So that's some good news now. They do not currently have a rating program for walls, but the reflectivity and emissivity values of the paint system do not change from a roof of wall. It just deals with exposure. And good news is that uh, some of the bigger industry uh, companies are starting to look at evaluating these uh, products for their cool ratings. Today's single skin metal siding panels can contribute to many different green certification programs, with, such as LEED V4.1, Green Globe, CHIPS, which is a collaborative for high-performing schools, and the Living Building Challenge. From a green building certification standpoint, we've conducted a comprehensive assessment of LEED V4.1 to determine how metal roof and siding products can contribute to green certification programs. Although this assessment is based on the USGBC's LEED V4.1 system, several of the categories in LEED are similar to other green building certification programs like Green Globe and CHIPS, which I uh, formed you as a collaborative for high-performing schools. Depending on the design of your project, metal siding can contribute to green design and certification programs. So this is a look at the current uh, LEED V4.1 points contributions. Um, uh, got heat island reduction, optimized energy performance, uh, building life cycle impact, building production, uh, the list goes on here. Uh, with new current LEED V4.1, the metal is worth many, many, many more points than uh, previous versions of lead. So um, I, I recommend you guys to, if you need to, and more information on this, to contact us directly. And we also have this information published on our website. So for the Building Living Challenge, building products fit in the material petals red list of the Living Building Challenge. To be eligible, a manufacturer has to disclose 100% ingredients to 100 parts per million of materials and chemicals on the red list. Today, metal siding panels can meet the LBC red list free criteria. Metal siding panels coated in zinc loom, also referred to as galvalum, with a clear protective resin coating, meet the LBC red list free criteria can be ordered as a standard offer at no extra cost. So it's not an additional cost to be able to qualify for this, um, offers a natural steel aesthetic design and available in multiple profiles. And it's an example of a, uh, a special waste collection facility up in Elk Grove, California, that was coated in the, the bare zinc aluminum siding there that you can see. Just as an example of what that looks like. Metal siding panels with a cool painted coating also meet the LBC red list free criteria. Typically a special order with minimum order requirements and offered at a higher price. There are some challenges dealing with the paint systems as far as getting them listed into the living building challenge because of material having to be 100, ingredients having to be 100% disclosed. So. They go, there's hesitation by coating manufacturers to provide proprietary information on paint formulas. Standard corrosion resistant primers contain low levels of chrome. Factory applied paints often contain a curing chemical that while on the red list is reacted and eliminated during the curing process. Despite the presence of a few red list substances, pre-painted metal is inherently safe and does not pose a risk. Industry has been working through this concern and there have been some performance trade-offs which until recently were significant and there is progress and we are actively pursuing a suitable replacement.
And that's the end of that section, Paul, and I'll turn that over to you if we have any additional questions. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, we do have a question uh, about the LEAD program. There's gone, LEAD's gone mm -hmm. through quite a number of changes over the years, and uh, metal siding has contributed points over those years. Uh, where does it stand now with a LEAD 4.1? Is it contributing more points, less, fewer points? How's it working out? Yeah, so yes. Yeah, previous LEAD requirements only allowed for points for recycled content, which about, you're only going to get about two points for that. And heat island effect, which you would get one one point for that. And then there's another one, uh, regional source materials. If as long as the material came within 500 miles of the project, you're available for a certain amount of points there. But with current LEED V4.1, there's more categories for LEED points and accumulation, accumulation. New categories include energy and atmosphere materials, well, excuse me, energy and atmosphere, which is available for one to six points, depending on how where you fall in there. Materials and resources can attribute up to 14, point, or 14 points based on category compliance. Indoor environmental quality, one to three points. Um, walls are still not eligible for heat island effect credits. However, we feel that once CRRC establishes a rating system, this will change. So many, 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 many more points are available of, uh, for contributing towards LEED in the current 4.1 model as opposed to the uh, pre lead models. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I got a couple of more questions, but I'm going to hold them. They're a little bit more general in nature than rather than to this specific uh, section. So uh, mm -hmm. I want to encourage the audience to keep submitting your questions, but uh, let's keep pressing on here, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, and absolutely. And afterwards, if, if the questions need to be answered, we can take those on a case-by-case -case basis and everybody's going to get my contact information. We'll be more than happy to help you out. So. So moving into the learning objective three focuses on metal siding types and specification considerations. So what we have here, there's two types of metal siding. There's exposed fasten and concealed fastens. And we have an example of those. Exposed fasten relies on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, exposed, fa exposed fasten siding relies on, relies on visible fastening devices to carry the material to the structure, which is what we have an example of over here on this picture. And then we have concealed fasten siding that has no visible attachment points. And this type of siding can include direct attachment or clip attachment of the siding. And we're going to get into the types of siding and show, well, why would one use a clip and not the other? So we're going to get a little bit more into that. But this is just an example shown here of uh, exposed fasten versus concealed fasten. So exposed fasten panels rely on visible fastening devices to secure the material to the, stru to the structure. Standard common gauges for exposed fastened metal siding panels tend to use thicker material to accommodate requirements for positive loading only or areas near heavy human interaction. So if you got something that's going to be down on the ground level, you don't want to tend to use a 29 gauge panel that would bend if somebody leaned up on it. Uh, steel, 29 gauge through 22 gauge are industry standard gauges, and then you can also have the ability to roll corrugated style profiles in aluminum, which is available in 050, 040, and 032 thicknesses. Profile shape typically drives the thickness of the aluminum that can be used, and this is some common examples of an exposed fasten profile showing here, and then we've got, you know, shows the visible fasteners and the attachment patterns. For that here, so and uh, here's an example of some common shapes for exposed fasten panels. You know, they are corrugated style panels. We have boxy corrugated, we have wavy style corrugated, corrugated with high ribs and minor ribs. Um, you'll notice the difference between these two profiles here specifically is that we also, you know, the industry has the ability to reverse roll many of these profiles so that if you like a pronounced wider rib as opposed to a narrow rib, the, the, we have the ability to flip the coil around and reverse roll it. A lot of manufacturers have that ability to do that. Also having the ability that if it's an interior application and you want a particular look, we can reverse roll coil and get this desired look on a specific corrugated profile. Um, you know, if you needed something uh, exposed on an interior application. And then here's some examples of exposed fasten profiles used. Uh, we have one here with an REI 
and a Verizon store. These are examples of uh, vertical orientation, exposed fast and profiles. Again, some more exposed fast and style profiles. Again, and, and you can see the vivid colors and things that these panels can be painted in and are available in. So going into the next family of wall panels are the concealed fasten profiles, which provide their own unique look and texture when selected as a siding. Concealed fasten siding provides clean lines by eliminating the need for exposed fasteners and are often chosen over exposed fastener panels for weather tightness is a concern. Panels can include direct attachment or clip attachment of the siding to the structure. Steel is generally available in 24 and 22 gauge, which are the industry standards, and concealed attachment profiles can be produced in aluminum in 050, 040, and 032, and profile usually drives the thickness of the aluminum that's used there. And here we've got some examples of some concealed fastened profiles. We're going to get a little bit more into it, but these are generally fastenings achieved here on these nailer strips. And then covered up with a male female interaction, covers up any of the fasteners, leaving for a nice clean aesthetic. This is an example of a concealed fasten system utilizing uh, this style panel in a smooth orientation without the waves. And again, here's some more examples of concealed fasten attachment panel system used on wall applications. Kind of give you some of the wide range and color and color mixing that you can do on these projects. And yet, we've got a little bit more here on a horizontal and vertical orientation. So, lots of things you can do with these profiles. And also, here, which we're going to talk about a little bit more, but this is actually mixed profiles where they have the same lap configuration. So, you can actually mix multiple designs of the same panel and uh, integrate that into your design aesthetic. So let's get into thermal movement, one of my favorite topics in dealing with metal. So expansion contraction. Environmental factors driven primarily by temperature fluctuations cause panel assemblies to expand and contract. And this is something that's often overlooked in design and in the installation that I run into in the field quite a bit. And I try to do my best to educate the industry on what expansion contraction is, how it performs, reacts, and how it can be detrimental to roofing and siding. So for steel panels, you can get expect about an eighth of an inch plus or minus the thermal movement per 10 foot of panel length. And then for aluminum, the rate is doubled. You can get up to a quarter of an inch per 10 foot of panel length. So... You know, if you're looking at about a 20 foot panel run for steel, you're going to be dealing with about a quarter inch of movement, plus or minus expansion and contraction. When you're dealing with aluminum for a 20, the same 20 foot run, you could be seeing upwards of a half of an inch of thermal movement, plus or minus. Extrapolate that out further you go with the longer the panels, the movement increases, and special considerations need to be taken to accommodate for said movement. Uh, most concealed fastener panels allow for thermal expansion through the use of single piece clips that slide within the panel seam. So basically, more or less, we have clips that attach the panel system. The panel system is allowed to free movement within the clip itself. Staying on the topic of uh, expansion and contraction, exposed fastener panels do not accommodate for thermal movement. So this is something to also take into consideration when designed. So the fastener mounting hole may stretch or tear, ultimately resulting in leaks. For the right applications, there are many benefits to exposed fastener profiles. They offer a classic design, offered in a large range of finishes and textures, ease of installation, easy to repair and replace. You know, it's a corrugated panel. You can just unscrew it, pop it out, pop it back in, make some practical option for high traffic areas where panels could be more prone to damage. And with proper sealant placement, exposed fastener panels can provide adequate air and water infiltration control and may have been tested for ASTM standards. And we've got a couple of examples of some of the air and water infiltration tests there at 283 and 331 there at the bottom.
So we're going to talk next into the lap configurations or how these panels actually work and come together um, when you're installing this. So there's three main types of laps utilized in metal siding. The first is a traditional side lap where one panel rests over the adjacent panel, and this lap is most commonly found in exposed fastened siding panels. A field applied lap sealant is required to keep side laps weather tight. And I've got a showing here where we actually apply uh, lap sealant to prevent any wind driven rain or moisture from entering into the panel system through capillary action. But this is just, it's a boxy core, or excuse me, a trapezoidal. Uh, panel configuration, and it's, it's pretty simple deal. You've got one leg that rests over the next leg, and uh, boom, just keep moving on with the install. Not too complex there. The second lap condition is called an integral seam. So an integral seam utilizes a male and female lap engagement. The panel attachment is achieved by directly fastening through the nailer strip, which we've got here showing the fastener head on the female leg. Then the male leg is then interlocked concealing the attachment point. Some integral seam panels offer clip attachment as well for higher wind load resistance. And integral seam panels are typically offered with factory sealant in the female leg or sealant can be applied in the field. And this is a show for where that sealant is a typically implied from the factory. And this is a step profile. Uh, so I was showing you on a few slides ago where we actually have a fastener that goes through a nailer strip and then the male leg comes in and covers that up so that you can't see any of the exposed fasteners that are securing the actual profile. Something of interest with this panel is that you are going directly through a nailing strip. So while it is a concealed fastened profile, it still is treated the same way as an exposed fastened profile that where you'll have expansion and contraction that can actually elongate where the fasteners are driven. However, it's not as detrimental on these type of panel systems because the fastening is back behind the system and the panels will expand and contract to a point where they'll loosen up to get free movement, but they won't disengage out of there. So you're not going to have to worry about that panel popping off because the fastener is basically just going to work itself back and forth through thermal expansion and contraction to where it's got enough movement or gap in there within that fastener. So the benefits of using a concealed fastener is because on this style is that you're not going to still have any concerns with water infiltration at the fasteners. But just to point out that this is still technically considered a through fasten style application. So hope I didn't confuse anybody there too much on that one. So the third lap configuration is what we call refer to as a hook seam. Now a hook seam utilizes two reverse rolled hems that are positively engaged each other. The panel attachment is achieved by direct fastening through a nailer strip, which we're showing here, on the mounting flange of the panel or with a clip that is attached to the substrate, which we've got examples of here. The other side of the panel has a leg or hook that is then interlocked, which conceals the attachment points. Some integral seam panels offer clip attachment as well as are available with factory or field applied sealing. Now, the benefits in talking with that last slide, you'll notice we've got a fastener driven right to the panel. Well, the panel is still going to expand and contract. So with this type of fastening, the panel is going to move, buckle, and it's going to eventually work itself so that it elongates the hole where that fastener is driven. The benefits of utilizing a clip system is that the fastener is outside of the panel line, and the panels are actually sitting in the clip here and almost on a track system can expand and contract freely. So that's the benefits of utilizing a clip system as opposed to a direct fasten method. Now, a direct fasten method is a lot quicker and faster for an installer, but as far as a longevity standpoint, performance attribute standpoint, clip of fasten is a much more sound way to go as far as attachment goes for, for the concerns with fastener, the whole elongation. So each op option offers a designer of the choice depending on the project structural and aesthetic needs. So an integral and hook seam panels would generally have a substantially higher structural performance when used with clips. They offer better wind or weather retightness than exposed, uh, weather tightness than exposed fastener panels due to the concealed attachment and may have been tested or improved through ASTM standards. Integral and hook seam panels are generally preferred for the most visually demanding architectural applications and are easy to install. 
and one piece clips used with the hook seam panels are often simple in design and provide unlimited thermal movement because the panels expand and contract within the clip itself. Now this is an example of an exposed fasten panel. The laps are pretty hard to see here, but the laps are just laying over themselves and you can tell where a lap line is because we've got fastening rows coming across here, across here and across here. But if you look, you can see we've got a vertical orientation of fasteners and these are our actually exposed lap lines. So this is just to kind of show you an example of what a corrugated through fasten style lap would look like in the field installed. And that's the end of this section three. And Paul, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and take those yeah, on. Yeah, I do have a question about uh, the, uh, great stuff on the, the, the fastening systems. Um, uh, somebody noticed that there were some standing seam roof panels that were being used in wall applications in some of these slides. Is uh, that accurate? Is that something you see pretty regularly? Absolutely, that is 100% accurate. So while this, pre this, pre oh, excuse me, this presentation is primarily centered around specifically designed wall panels, standing seam roof panels are gaining popularity in the wall market segment, and they offer concealed attachment, clean vertical lines. Many reputable manufacturers have details for installing standing seam roof panels on wall applications, and I'm sure some of the participants and architects on the call here may have actually used some standing seam panels for a wall application. So the they, great, great, great question. But the, yes, 100%, you can utilize standing seam panels on a wall. Great, thanks. I got another question, um, uh, and if this may be off topic as well, from Nicholas about the best product for soffit applications. Or is that too broad of a topic? Well, it, it, there's a lot of different ways you can handle a soffit. I've seen exposed fastener panels for soffits. I've seen a concealed fasten panel for soffits. Um, many of the industry have purposely built soffit panels. A lot of the times the integral seam panels are used for soffits because we don't, you know, most design aesthetics don't want to see exposed fastener. But really it comes down because of it being a soffit, not really being a weather tight condition because there's not concern for it being truly exposed to a lot of the elements, it really is going to come down and play down to what personal preference are and look. More or less, any panel that's offered out there in the industry could be used for a soffit application. And I have seen just about anything that we offer as far as in our wall panel segment used on a soffit application. So I hope that helps answer some of the questions. That might be a little bit vague, but <laughs> I do apologize. But um, there's, there is no, no preferable choice. I, and I have one final question in this section, and this I think is answered in your job title. Um, does the industry offer technical design assistance to architects for specific projects? Absolutely, absolutely. We welcome it. Uh, we would prefer that you guys do reach out to us on design assistance and detail review. We have a full staff technical department that does have the ability to look at pre-designed details and make sure you guys are dotting the i's and crossing the t's before things go to plan check or to make sure that the details are accurate and the other thing is most reputable manufacturers have the ability to do site specific product specific shop drawings which is another interesting aspect that we do for a lot of our installers where we'll take the details that were provided and we know that architects you, it's impossible for architects to know everything about everything out there as far as the details go. Well, when you have a manufacturer that can produce details for, and was, we don't produce details for the architectural community, we're, we're doing it mainly for the basis of the installer, which are then submitted to the architect. We're giving you specific details as we would recommend them install with fastener call-outs, flashing call-outs. So it's a, it's a great opportunity, but yes, just to answer that question, I got, I got a little deeper on that one, but we do absolutely welcome and encourage design, you know, pre-construction design review of details. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left here, and Jeff's still got a bit more to go through, and we want to leave some room for questions at the end, so let's proceed. Yeah, good news is we're on the last section here, so we'll go ahead and move on. So the last section focuses on design and installation considerations. So single skid metal siding panels have the ability to be installed vertically or horizontally on a combination of both vertical and horizontal, which offers beautiful design options. So this is a, these are projects where we actually have mixed use and different style profiles installed in vertical and horizontal orientation. So this just kind of shows 
some of the mixing that you can do. You don't have to cover a wall in one product going one direction. You can mix them, match them, choose different colors, different horizontal and vertical applications. Vertical applications offer the installer flexibility in installing installation by allowing panels to be installed left to right or right to left. So when you're installing vertically, you can start from one end of the building or start from the other end of the building and work your way across. So that offers flexibility with an installation that if a building hasn't quite caught up and they want to start getting it dried in and paneled in, they can start from the opposite end that's not finished yet. So that's, that's dealing with uh, vertical and horizontal application, which we're going to be talking about horizontal, which is a bit different compared to a vertical installation. So now that we're talking about horizontal applications, which as mentioned, we're a bit different. When installing an integral seam panel, this is the second lap configuration that we talked about in the last section, they are intended to be installed from the top of the elevation down due to their seam configuration. So if you look here, we want to make sure that if you're installing from the bottom up, you'll notice here installed there runoff can actually get in there and be trapped with inside of the seam here so if you're using this type of panel seam it is 100 percent recommended that installation starts from the top down so that when runoff comes off everything's draining off as you can see here we've got a chance for moisture to be trapped in here if we've got runoff and this is from a product if it was installed from the bottom up now with this type of seam we want to install it from the top down to make sure that the female is reversed down so that we're not having the potential of trapping moisture. So traditional side lap and hook seams are just the opposite of an integral seam panel. Traditional side lap and hook seam panels are required to be installed from the bottom of an elevation up, which allows runoff to flow over the lap. Installing from the top down can compromise weather tightness, tightness over time due to exposed seams. It's important to take these details into consideration when selecting an appropriate product for a specific ac application and for phasing of the installation. So this is more things we deal with with the installer, but just things to keep in mind that if you have certain sequencing or phasing of installations that the type of panel you chose can impact that, that if we have to start from the top of the elevation and work our way down or vice versa, if we have to work from the bottom up. And this is an example here showing that we've got a lap here, an exposed fasten panel in a horizontal orientation. Water will flow over. Same thing with a hook seam. Water will flow over. If this was reversed, water could get trapped within there. This is an interesting slide. So this is just talking about the different types of substrates and this goes back to the question uh, you had, Paul, regarding the use of standing seam. This is a standing seam panel being used on a wall application uh, here, which is being installed in five-foot segments. And this is actually what they call a batten seam roof panel, where they segmented the pan of the panel, as you'll notice by the horizontal lap line. But then the seams of itself are actually continuous seams. So it gives a really neat design aesthetic. But this is just kind of an example of a standing seam based off of the last question we got. So uh, metal substrates can be installed, or metal panels can be installed on many, many different substrates, such as dimensional lumber, plywood, OSB, cold form steel, such as season Z, steel deck, hot rolled steel, uh, structural steel, and concrete or masonry. And this is an example, a great example here. We're actually installing these panels directly attached to a CMU wall here, with clips attached with concrete fasteners. So it was quite a neat installation here. Specifying fasteners, specifying fasteners that hold the panel or panel clip to the substrate is a critical component of a properly designed panel assembly. Fastener size is generally defined by the, uh, the panel, clip fastener clearance and substrate being utilized. Manufacturer will include the approved fastener size based on the panel in their approval report or their installation guides or by contacting the panel manufacturer's representative. It is the underlying substrate type and thickness that determines the fastener length, point, and thread type. 
fastener should be obtained through the panel manufacturer when possible to ensure that the appropriate fastener is being utilized so the overall panel assembly capacities can be met. I'm going to talk a little bit about evaluation reports. So there are several key certification bodies that uh, issue product approval reports. I'm sure most of you on this line are familiar with a lot of those. We have uh, IATMO uh, evaluation reports, the ICC, which is pretty much the industry standard for evaluation reports, Intertech re evaluation reports, and also UL has evaluation reports. So the process of an evaluate, uh, evaluation report is as follows. It starts with a certification body who develops evaluation criteria. They have a document which defines requirements for product to meet code provisions and for conditions where codes do not address the necessary requirements. Next, the product manufacturer seeking approval must submit all independent test data, performance calculations, et cetera, as required by the evaluation criteria. Certification body evaluates manufactured performance data against requirements stated within the evaluation criteria. And if approved, the certification body, be, the body publishes a product approval report. IATMO is currently the only node certification body that has an evaluation criteria for metal siding. Now, metal siding and roof panels are prescriptively defined within the building code and generally do not require a product approval report even though a lot, we get a lot of questions for those. However, manufacturers who have approval reports available make them significantly easy to work with as all published performance data has been thoroughly evaluated by an accredited certification body. So though the building code does not require it, a lot of reputable manufacturers are going with these types of evaluation reports just to help smooth things along through plan check and things of that nature. And this is an example of an IATMO report. It publishes section properties based on panel gauge. They also provide inward loading based on panel gauge and the spans, and then negative and outward loading based on gauge substrate fastener and fastener spacing. So we have positive loading for people walking on it, equipment being loading on, on the material itself, and then outward negative, which is what we deal with for wind uplift resistance. So published values, they do help give you the fastener recommendation, the gauge of the substrate you're attaching to, the type of attachment pattern that's needed, and then the spacing of the attachment, which then the values are published here within there for, uh, for an engineer to verify if the product will work and meet specific requirements. So moving on to underlayment. Specifying underlayment for metal siding often comes down to three basic needs. The first is to dry in the building in so other work can proceed within the building. And if inclement weather hits, the building envelope is secure. The second is to protect against the chance that moisture will penetrate the metal siding system and act as a secondary moisture barrier. And the third is to allow the means of escape for backside condensation, which may occur in certain metal siding applications. This condensation must be directed out of the system. Siding underlayment is typically required to be semi-impermeable. This means that the underlayment will allow the passage of vapor in one direction, which is from the inside out. The underlayment does not allow the passage of vapor or condensation into the building. There's a class rating system for siding underlayment, which is climate zone driven and should be considered before choosing an appropriate underlayment for a specific project. Underlayment class ratings go down from a class one, which has a perm rating of 0.1, and it's considered vapor impermeable. Class two, which is from a 0.1 up to 1.0, which is considered semi-impermeable. And then we have a class three, which is considered vapor permeable and can range from a 1.0 up to a 10. Uh, ASTM E96 determines the perm rating for underlayments. The appropriate underlayment siding vapor barriers rely upon external and internal siding assembly, cavity, and insulation. The underlayment used for a concrete block is different from wood, which is different from a rain screen system. So a type two or type three vapor barrier is typically required on most applications, giving a vapor perm rating of up to 2.1. 
the exceptions being coastal environments, refrigerated buildings, indoor pools, amphitheaters, or structures that use a non-typical deck or siding material such as tectum or lightweight concrete. Polyethylene or foil-faced underlayment is acceptable for external applications but should not be used on the interior as it facilitates molding. Climate zones also need to be taken into consideration as they contribute toward the selection of an appropriate perm rating for the underlayment. So I'll, while we can sit there and suggest a particular underlayment, it really is code driven and climate zone driven. So I, you know, any questions that may come up on what I need to use for a specific project, you're going to want to look at your climate zones and the code requirements for said project and where that's located. We'll go on to the last real quick section, which is some of the installation details. So this is the uh, this is a base condition. So there are these are typical base trim details for vertical and horizontal. So we have a horizontal and vertical here. Careful consideration should be taken to ensure all base conditions are installed above grade to avoid any potential issues with standing or ponding water. Standing moisture at the base condition can promote premature material corrosion. Please note that there is a quarter inch gap here shown on both of these details at the base of the bottom to allow for weepage of the back, any backside moisture or condensation. Material should also avoid direct contact with mortar or concrete. If at all possible, aluminum zinc should not be used in, on, or around concrete or mortar or concrete and mortar or highly alkaline environments. Bare aluminum zinc and painted aluminum zinc offer, will suffer rapid corrosion when in contact with these materials. So for vertical applications, it's important to note that from a detail and design perspective, the siding trim is sloped away from the building. Uh, what they're talking about here is that this photo with the gray siding shows what cut panel edge terminated into a J trim, which is right down here. So we have actually a J metal that was installed at the base instead of on the previous slide where we actually have a drip trim that's not encapsulating the end of the panel here. This one is actually encapsulated in a J metal. Um, what can happen is the J trim used at the base of the siding will trap moisture and act as a gutter. This can lead to premature panel deterioration as shown in that photo. Siding base trim is sloped away from the building is critical. So this is what we actually, they entrap the bottom and because the moisture was not allowed to act, uh, exit in that because the panel edges were just buried into it, you can see that we do have some corrosion on the material. Uh, typical parapet cap detail with siding panels installed in a vertical orientation, or excuse me, horizontal orientation. Notice that there is some slope built into the parapet cap itself to prevent ponding on top of the parapet wall. Also, the exposed interior of the parapet is a concealed fasten attached with a trim cleat. Um, this allows for the parapet to show no visible or fasteners on the exposed side. That's what we're showing here so that it gives you a nice clean attachment and you're not going to see any fasteners. Only the interior side of the cap flashing utilizes and exposed fasteners as it's not possible to engage both sides of the parapet with a cleat. So if we hook this side with a cleat and I did the same, if I, excuse me, I was pointing at the wrong screen now, everybody. But this side's hooked on with a cleat, fasteners hidden back behind the parapet cap. This side utilizes exposed fastener. If I'd used a cleat method to attach both sides, I would be able to get one side hooked, but there'd be impossible for me to get the other side hooked onto there. So. We utilize an exposed fastener system on the outside of the parapet cap on the uh, non-exposed side of that wall. These are, these are typical inside and outside corner details which utilize flat trim pieces that cover the factory cut edge of the profile. The trim pieces are typically attached to the high ribs of the panel with blind rivets at 12 inch on center to maximize the appearance of exposed fasteners or minimize the experience of exposed fasteners. Profile closures are installed between the panel and corner trim to prevent wind driven particulate or pests and keep them out of the condition, essentially making a weather resistive seal in the corners. And that's what we've got here. That's showing the foam closures if it's a profiled wall panel that's being utilized. And this is an example of a outside corner and an inside corner on a very unique, interesting application where they actually utilize the same panel profile, but mixed colors. So this is kind of a neat design aesthetic, something to take into consideration that you don't have to use all one color on the wall. You can actually mix colors and get a very, very neat looking building. 
Jeff, I'm sorry for the interruption, but we're at yep. the top of the hour, and I just want to let the audience know you've got a little bit more to go through, so hang in there, and we'll be finishing up pretty quickly. Yep, so just I'm going to move as quickly as possible. Right. Absolutely, I'm going to move through these next few slides just as quickly as I can. So this is an example of um, another outside corner, that's an inside corner that we didn't talk about in that slide, which utilizes a vertical trim piece. These are what we actually call mitered corners or profiled corners, and this is where we can actually take a panel, bend it, and get it to transition around a corner or inside of a corner to give the appearance that the panel is actually transitioning around in one piece. It's a very interesting and neat design aesthetic. Typical window, door, louver, head condition with a horizontal panel application. A header trim is installed prior to whatever might be installed at this condition. That's what we're showing here on this flashing before the frame or the door or the window gets installed. This allows for a proper seal between the header flashing and open framing. Just like the base detail, there is a quarter inch gap needed for weepage at this condition. This is a typical jam detail for a horizontal application as the trim is installed prior to what is being installed in the opening. Again, this is where we've got that trim covering up. And then the panels then are tucked in behind the trim and secured with rivets at eight inch, or 12 inches on center. And profile closures are used to seal the gaps here if need to be. And here's an example or another detail of what we've got is at the sill. Still the same type of installation. The sill trim is installed prior to any of the sequencing of the window frame or doors and things of that nature. Um, then we simply just stuff a panel up underneath it, and there's some examples of some windows and some doors on a uh, horizontal application. Uh, this is a neat uh, application. This unique condition would be a uh, siding panel or a fascia panel to a soffit transition. It's handled the same as a typical base condition with one exception. The cover trim is an adaptation of the base trim flashing with an extra long return. That's what they're showing here, which is turning down, and we've got the same type of return coming back onto this condition here. Placement of the cover trim should be considered carefully as the sufficient gap will be needed to account for the thickness of the soffit material that is going behind it. Sequencing of this installation would be the soffit material first and cover trim followed by the siding and the fascia panel. Siding penetration details can be a bit tricky and truly rely on the skill and attention to detail by the installing contractor. Typical details are achieved by mounting a flat plate onto the surface of the panel to allow the mounting of various lighting and other mounting fixtures. And there's an example that we've got of some fixtures going through some siding where flat plates were used to give a nice clean mounting area for the penetration of said wall fixtures. I do apologize, everyone. I'm trying to get through this as quickly as possible. We're almost done. We're almost done. <laughs> um, this is an end lap condition. So end laps for nestable products are fairly simple to achieve. Panels will just lay over one another. This is known as nesting. Nestable products are typically exposed fasten profiles. Concealed fasten profiles cannot utilize a nestable end lap due to the panel profile complexity. So these types of laps are usually between three and six inches and sealed within the lap of two beads of gun grade, non-skinning butyl, and nestable overlaps give a clean and straight lap. As you can see, it's very hard to see this, but there are lap lines within this wall, and this is showing a typical lap detail here. Unlike nestable profiles, which we just talked about, non-nestable profiles require through fasten trim pieces to achieve panel end laps. This may work with desired panel aesthetics. Flashing lap lines can be coordinated in a way to match siding opening locations, floor levels on multi-story projects. They work with both horizontal and vertical orientation. Vertical trim lap lines shown with vertical, with, with, so we have vertical trim lap lines here, horizontal applications. And this is some of the detailing that we deal with some of that. So it's kind of a neat aesthetic. Next, we've got a typical detail on how to achieve that where we use a butt splice plate and panels are just lined up with each other. Again, panel complexity within these concealed fasten style profiles do not allow for nestable laps to lay over one another. So we do require the butt laps on those. Here are some examples of 
different splices. These are butt laps shown here in a mix of colors that we talked about on a few slides ago. This is another butt lap. And you've got to be real careful with the aesthetic here because this is, you know, you can see some of the seams may misalign slightly um, here. So you can kind of see within that there. So. And then also with dealing with uh, vertical panel orientation with horizontal trim lap lines gives a unique appearance and lap lines can be laid out to match siding openings or floor levels on multi-story complexes. So this is what we did here with the openings. Um, this is just vertical orientation with a separator trim installed here, as you can see, gives kind of a neat perspective on that. And that's it. We made it five, six minutes late. That's excellent, Jeff. Thank, on. thank you so much. Um, gosh, we got a lot of questions, and I'm afraid we're not going to be able to get to maybe just about one or two of them. So I want to encourage everybody, if you have a question, and boy, some of these are really good, to follow up directly with Jeff afterwards. Absolutely. Um, I am going to be monitoring email on you guys. If you have direct questions, my information is attached. So, Paul, if you want to ask one of the two of the good yeah. ones you've got here, and then I can take up any more on a personal level that came through. Great. One of the one of the questions the the uh, audience member raised the issue of oil canning. All the details you talked about here in this last last section uh, uh, avoid that issue. But he would like you to kind of to kind of talk about how colors, clips, the profile, the gauge affect oil canning. This may be a, an hour seminar in itself. But can you just yeah, it, jump it into be, that one? But I'll give you the reader. Yeah, I'll give you the reader's digest version on that. So gauge, color substrates, those all affect oil canning. Typically, if oil canning is going to be a concern, you you know, the lighter the color, the less apparent it's going to be. The heavier the gauge, it helps stiffen the profile up, which can also assist in oil canning or, or minimizing oil canning. Profiled shapes, multiple ribs, things of that help eliminate that. The problem where you run into oil canning is where you run into wide, flat, smooth surfaces. Manufacturers have the ability to run pencil ribs in certain profiles or striations, which is a big one, which help put minor subtle striations or ribs within the flat pan to help mitigate or eliminate some of that oil canning. When you're dealing with flat smooth panels, and this predominantly is if you're using standing seam applications on a wall where you can run into oil canning, darker the color, the more prevalent it's gonna be, the wider the profile, the more prevalent. If it's a smooth profile, it's prevalent. You don't really run into oil canning on corrugated boxy style panels. You, you mostly run into that. And I, I have a lot of technical bulletins and I'd be happy to answer at more in depth on oil canning and ways to eliminate it and things to look for and stuff like that if we need to. Excellent. I think also the Metal Construction Association has some technical bulletins that they put together on their website for folks for resources as well. Um, final question. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Can you touch again on why it's important to work with a manufacturer with an engineered evaluation report for their products? It is not critical, but it does help move things through plan check much faster. So as I stated, metal wall panels are defined in a building code and are not considered an alternate means or method, which would require an evaluation report. So by having an evaluation report, all performance data of the profile is published for section properties, as well as negative outward loading, wind uplift pressure, for example, and positive loading, which would be live load, such as someone walking on the roof or equipment being installed on the roof, like solar panels and such. Excellent. So I hope that helps answer that. Yeah, great. Uh, what a wonderful presentation, Jeff. Thank you so much for taking your time, and thanks everybody else for uh, everybody in the audience for participating. Um, like I've said a couple of times, if you want more information, you can go to aepspan.com. You can contact Jeff directly. Look for those follow-up emails tomorrow with more information about downloading this presentation and getting certificates and all of that. Thank you all for attending. We're going to do another webinar in October, so look for information on that upcoming webinar um, again. Thank you, Jeff. Great presentation, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody.